I'm Alan Mortis, and this is Think Radio Presents Think Planet. I'm joined today by Gavin Van Horn. Then the earth is a, a machine or a clock that God winds. It's an object. It's not a subject that requires us to be in dialogue and conversation with it as a community partner. It is a, an object. From that, it's easy to go from object with no sort of inherent moral worth except, you know, in how it reflects on our own kind of character to object as commodity. Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio. Think Planet is made possible by support from the Western Colorado University School of Environment and Sustainability, empowering future change agents to foster ecologically resilient, economically sustainable, and socially just communities throughout the world. If you like Think Planet, then I know you'll enjoy the other shows in the Think Radio Presents family of podcasts. Think People, a celebration of just how amazing people can be. Think Business, a weekly discussion with entrepreneurs, innovators, and disruptors on sustainable business into the 21st century. Subscribe to Think Radio Presents on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you get great content. And don't forget to help us spread the word by liking our social media channels and sharing the content we post. We're grateful to have you in the conversation on Think Radio Presents. I'm joined today by Gavin Van Horn. He's an author, scholar, and deep thinker about the interdependence of humans and our non-human neighbors. Uh, Gavin earned a Master of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary and a doctorate from the University of Florida with specialization in religion and nature. He currently lives in Chicago, where he's on staff at the Center for Humans and Nature. His most recent book is as insightful as it is delightful to read. It's called The Way of Coyote, Shared Journeys in the Urban Wilds. Gavin, thanks for stopping by. Thank you. You have a nice radio voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, that's good to know, considering that I'm sitting in this chair. Y you know, as I, uh, when I opened up your book, and I, I haven't had nearly enough time with it, but so many possible threads of conversation just like spilled out that I realized our biggest challenge today is going to be narrowing them down to talk about something. Mm -hmm. But I think that the place to start really is with a thing that leapt out at me about your past, and that is that you've studied religion. And here you are also in the business and uh, academic circles of environmental thought and activism. Right. Those are not, in today's world, in you know, sort of the modern secular world, those aren't common pairings. And so I'd love to have you take us down the path of how you got to be where you are and doing what you do. Okay, yeah, that's that's great. And I could, we could go far down that path. Um, and I think you're right that they're not commonly paired together, although sometimes environmentalists get accused of being, um, you know, pagan or, <laughs> right. you know, um, uh, their religion is too... Uh, uh, too close to earth worship, you know, and it gets mm. folks into trouble. Uh, so there is maybe that that comes up every once in a while. But I think um, that also reflects a kind of uh, what you're talking about, that what that they don't get paired reflects a kind of siloed, you know, thinking, a division between the humanities and the sciences. and Which goes back quite a ways. Which goes back yeah, quite a ways. That's kind of a Renaissance rel relic, right? Uh, sure. And... You know, for me, um, though, it is always uh, religion has always been a fascination. Um, at one time, uh, a very uh, personal source of, of meaning for me. Uh, and at a certain point in my schooling, I mean, those were the, the classes that I wanted to go to that I found the most fascinating, thinking about what made humans tick, you know, mm. all these cultural, varied cultural expressions. Uh, you know, elaborate from elaborate art and sculpture to uh, rituals and ceremony and the many ways of being human on this planet. And, um, and at some point I wanted to take my love of the natural world and see where these things 
overlap because for me they always did it always made sense when i went out into you know a landscape like we have here in gunnison where we are right now those were places of sol- solace of sacrality mm-hmm. um there were places of awe and wonder all the classic expressions of maybe unitive experience or religious um, emotional valiances that that come up in those spaces and i think uh, you know, particularly uh, among kind of those early uh, conservationists and early environmental champions, they didn't shy from using that kind of language. No, you know? that's true. Just read John Muir. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> he was drinking sequoia sap, you know, yeah. uh, uh, going to the mountains for his good news. Um, and so those always, always overlapped for me. But it was surprising that once I got into deeper into um, the academic study of religion, uh, it became more about the humanities where the human was the human and the humanities was emphasized to the detriment of everything else. Mm. And so vast spaces, uh, in my mind, of territory that could be studied were not being studied, at least where I was at the time. That's well, changing. It shifted. Why do you think that is? How did we get there where uh, humanity, having grown up, mm-hmm. having evolved alongside everything else on the planet, how did we get to the point where you could say, now we pretty much scrubbed the the non-human world out of our thinking about meaning mm-hmm. and transcendence and so forth? How do we get there? Mm. Well, there's, I guess, two ways to look at that. One, it has always been there, but it just, it, it became, um, in academic context, there is a kind of implicit, if not explicit, anthropocentrism, anthropocentrism, uh, uh, humanism that, uh, you know, I mean, we could trace it all the way back to, you know, Greek philosophy, um, if we wanted to in the West and the ways that, uh, other forms of the great chain of being, you know, in, um, medieval theology, the ways that human beings were elevated, uh, and looked at as uniquely unique, if we want to call it that, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and other animals were only valuable insofar as they approximated human, uh, usually cognitive capacity, intelligence, you know, uh, our ability to problem solve, et cetera, et cetera. And I mean, and so we live with these legacies, sometimes what I call the Cartesian hangover. <laughs> um, you know, and Descartes was, was sort of famous for saying animals are, are automaton. You know, they, sure. they are machines. When they squeal in pain, uh, we don't have to really pay attention to that morally because they're, they're just, that's a, a reflex response. This heinous, heinous sort of, mm-hmm. you, know, um, you know, kind of the extreme end of the kind of anthropocentric perspective. But I think essentially we, there was a kind of cultural narcissism, you know, that, that um, precluded or looked at um, the emotional connection uh, to nature as one that uh, was, um, you know, anything from childlike to just not relevant. You know, well, that, primitive is a word that's often used to describe right. that relationship. Okay, so that's a great, that's a good kind of entry point into this because when the study of religion academically arose, um, particularly in Great Britain in the in the 19th century, in the late 19th century, and you had Edward B. Tyler. James Frazier and these other early religionists, they looked, they were influenced by an evolutionary model um, of a kind of ladder, you know, that we are mm. progressing along the way. And right. even, and it influenced the way that they studied religion and human culture in particular. And so people were animist were looked at as a kind of primitive form of religion that's that was superseded by Christianity. And these men who themselves weren't Christians thought that Christianity would be superseded by science eventually, that it was kind of Christianity was kind of a primitive form of science, but it was better than animism, (laughs) even if you allowed that that these sort of early systems of magical thinking worked for the people and you had a kind of charitable view of what those people were doing. It was still thought of as primitive along this kind of progressive Timeline, and of course, who is at the top of that timeline? Timeline, well, Europeans in in Great Britain, and in particular, industrializing Europeans at that time. That's right. right. So we always there's there's a kind of uh, of course a, a sort of self serving and self centered way, and maybe these these men um, weren't even consciously aware that they were using these metaphors and models. Um, 
in such a way that kind of valorized their own position in, in the kind of <laughs> food chain, if It's you will. a real pitfall when you get started thinking about anything. You right. have to guard against that. Right. And so so to take that um, uh, animism, uh, which is a, a kind of worldview that I'm probably closest to, <laughs> um, you know, now there's been a revival, uh, um, uh, neo-animism it's sometimes called, um, uh, you have um, earth-based religions um, or uh, religions that are um, trying to recapture some of those things that were neglected or actively suppressed for a long time. Uh, well, actively suppressed is putting it mildly. Yes. I mean, what we're talking about here is the Inquisition. We're talking about mm -hmm. witch burnings in Europe. Mm -hmm. We're talking about the decimation of Native religions, mm -hmm. confiscating drums from Native Americans, for instance, and mm -hmm. making it illegal to own one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, actively suppressed, uh-huh, we could yeah. say that. Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring that up because so many of the land-based conflicts that we now have in this country really come... Um, you know, I don't mean to put it too simply, but it comes down to a conflict of sacreds. And uh, I was um, I was just in Central California. Um, there was a, what's a run for salmon, uh, which is the Winnemem Wintu people are do a, a sort of prayer journey. Well, they call it a prayer journey. I kind of think of it as a pilgrimage along the migratory route of the winter run Chinook salmon mm. from um, the the uh, San Joaquin, uh, San Francisco Bay area of the Sacramento River to Mount Shasta. Mm -hmm. And they are, what they, say, what they say is they're trying to dance the salmon home. They're laying down these prayers so that the salmon know where to go. The salmon are severely threatened or extinct from that, this particular kind of salmon from that area. And they'd like to restore the salmon. But the salmon is just one piece of the puzzle. Really, they also have... Um, they, you'll hear the slogan, water is life, a lot. Mm. They're thinking about the whole watershed, everything that happens in that watershed that affects the salmon. So the salmon becomes a kind of proxy for all of these other issues, treatment of the watershed. And for them, and I would venture to say, I would hope it would be for all of us, water is a sacred thing. You don't violate what sustains all of life. And survive for long, at least. And survive for long. <laughs> and on the other side of that, why I say it's a conflict of the sacreds, is in some ways the, the worship of or the acquisition, the kind of um, you know, capitalistic society that we um, take for granted, um, has made the uh, continual acquisition, perpetual growth, a kind of ideology that water is not sacred it's what you can extract from the water it's that, a commodity that is like sacred. everything else right and to some degree that the the commodification of that is a kind of sacred thing if you think of sacred as being the thing that we elevate and give our most give the mo most of our attention to um and, and our lives revolve around it um so uh going back to seminary for a second yeah, if yeah, you'd allow me so please, please do yeah so I went to seminary to study, and I wanted to combine these interests, the, 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 my interest in religion, my interest in the natural world. And I found that I really had to kind of carve my own path there. There were a couple of offerings that sort of were on the border of it, like there was a class on maybe evolution and religion, or there was a class on, there was a class over at Princeton taught on environmental ethics and religion, and uh, that was helpful. And then I, you know, I took classes in, um, on uh, Christian mystics and mystics and other religious traditions, for instance. And oftentimes those folks have no problem, you know, in, in a way because, you know, uh, I say they have no problem. Of course, they had many problems with the church. Some were able to stay within it. Um, others were exiled, kicked out, or killed. Executed. Or mm -hmm. executed. Yep. Um, often because, you know, that this, uh, what I, I mentioned or referred to as a unitive experience before, I mean, sort of all bets are off. The church no longer has the same amount of control over these people. And oftentimes they reform the church in the long run. But, um, you know, uh, 
nevertheless, they're venturing into territory that may not be very comfortable for the officials of the institution, right? So those people were fascinating to me as well. And are you suggesting that part of that unitive experience for them was an awakening to the unity uh, of humanity and nature? Absolutely. I mean, think about St. Francis. Think about um, you know, his sermon to the birds, his canticle of the creatures. You can think about a person like Meister Eckhart, right. um, uh, Julian of Norwich, um, who talked about, you know, uh, the preciousness of a, of a hazelnut, um, or um, Hildegard von Bingen, who had a kind of, what, a verdant, a green theology in a way, you know, um, had these visions of, yeah. you know, uh, that were incredible. Um, so but they didn't, didn't leave humans out. I mean, Hildegard, for instance, you know, sure. famous visions about the, yeah. the majesty and beauty of the human being, but just not to the exclusion of everything else. Absolutely. And I don't think we should leave human beings out. That would be a mistake. Um, the, but the problem is, is that at least, so I'll just speak from, from my experience. There is a kind of um, amongst um, particularly in Protestant denominations, there has been an emphasis placed on the individual salvation. And there might be, depending on the denomination, there might be good social justice programs in place, there might be good community outreach in place, but it still comes down to an individual's relationship to God, and sometimes that, to put it baldly, whether you're saved or not, mm -hmm. and how you become saved. And... Um, and that hyper individualism, I think, is a product of you know of both religion and the culture at large sort of commingling um, in interesting and sometimes um, pathological ways. Um, but that sense of a larger community that includes the more than human was somewhat hard to be found hard to be found while I was in that graduate program. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I could kind of piecemeal get to it, but. Mm -hmm. And then there was a transition. There was a, a field called religion and ecology that was emerging at that in the early 90s where they were exploring different faith traditions and sort of looking at what are the, the greener aspects of these traditions? What are the mm -hmm. kinds of threads that have survived? And can those be turned toward, for people of faith, can those be turned toward um, environmental pro-environmental behavior? And so that was interesting. That was emerging. Um, and then there was a Ph.D. program that popped up, first of its kind, offering this degree in religion and nature. And that was at the University of Florida, which is, mm. which is where I went. Now, there are some master's programs that have a kind of that same sort of hybrid um, offering. But um, that's, that was kind of my journey. It was like, oh, here's this program that kind of... Uh, um, is researching that very intersection that I'm interested in. And so, you know, yeah, that's where I ended up. Well, as I predicted, you keep saying very prov provocative things that in threads that I want to just seize and follow. <laughs> um, one of them is the idea that um, secular culture and religion have commingled in the word you used was sometimes pathological ways. What did you mean by that? Mm. Well, I'll give you a, a famous example. It's been um, it's been critiqued in a number of ways, but it's still a powerful legacy. There's a uh, a historian, a medieval historian actually, named Lynn White, who dropped a kind of bomb, uh, <laughs> at least in academic circles. And I think it was in 1967 he wrote this article called The Historic Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. In that article, he um, essentially, and he himself was a, a Christian, he uh, said that Christianity has contributed in this, uh, unhelpfully, to this sense of separation between humankind and a kind of dominionistic theology mm -hmm. that's... S seeing the earth has fallen. A fallen instance. or a warehouse of resources or um, if you mix in the mechanical metaphors that got injected during the Enlightenment, then the earth is a, a machine or a clock that God winds. It's an object. It's not a uh -huh. subject that requires us to be in dialogue and conversation with it as a community partner. It is a, an object. From that, it's easy to go from 
object with no sort of inherent moral worth except, you know, in how it reflects on our own kind of character mm -hmm. to object as commodity only, uh, whose only value is for, you know, um, as part of a marketplace. Sure. There right? to be monetized. There to be monetized. Um, and he, it was a powerful article for a couple of reasons. One, it was short. So it was <laughs> that's unusual. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, you know, something you could read in a, a, a single sitting uh, in a very short time. Two, he's a good writer. Three, he was a historian who pulled all these interesting pieces together in a provocative way. And four, it appeared in Science Magazine. Okay. Very approachable to the general public. Yes. And also a huge circulation. And, you know, it wasn't in an obscure corner of the world, you know. So, mm -hmm. so uh, people have argued with that and contested various things that he said. But, you know, there's a kind of general sensibility that he's getting at that I think is why the, that critique has endured. Um, so you asked about pathological <laughs> commingling, if we want to call it that. Um, yeah, there are ways. OK, let's put it this way. Religion, in my mind, is a compass and a lens. And it's a compass in that it can orient us in place. It can orient us to in respect to our relationships to other humans and whether we think they're a part of our community or not, and other non-humans and whether we think they're a part of our community or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kinds of sacred obligations we have to place if it's only to particular uh, if it's only to a particular church building, if it's to Jerusalem, if it's um, you know to um, you know Medina. Uh, or or wherever yeah, it might be Mecca for instance. Mecca yeah sure where did where did where do you pray where do you bow and pray like mm -hmm. the direction talk about orientation right right um, so it can orient us in kind of time and space um, and it's a lens in that and this is where um, I don't have I mean it, it, this is where I, I mean to say that it is a kind of tool it can magnify the best in us or the worst in us and that depends upon what, to what end people are, are using it. Are they using it to rationalize their own behaviors? Are they using it to further reinforce what they already sort of think or believe? And that's kind of part of the cultural ethos or mm -hmm. ideology. Um, or are they using it to challenge how they think? Are they using it to, um, to critique uh, their own egocentricity? Are they using it, and frankly, are they using it to become a better person? <laughs> yeah. So that's where it's a lens. You know, it right. can magnify the best and worst in us, I think. Right, and I begin to see what you mean, that when you put that together with uh, the cultural momentum over the last 200 years toward commodification and extraction and so forth, um, those two might not um, be the most healthy pairing. Yeah. And maybe maybe can help explain some of what we see in the world today. Yeah. So the other thing that popped out at me in some of your recent comments was this shift that you describe in theological academic circles toward okay, well let's let's go and look at ecological mm -hmm. theology. Let's let's unpack some of these world religions and see what they have to offer. Uh, that sounded still kind of forensic. And, and academic mm -hmm. in a way, mm -hmm. you know, let's, let's sort of turn this upside down and shake it and see mm -hmm. what falls out. For you personally, mm -hmm. was there, can you describe a moment where, ah, I don't know, the, the clouds opened and the, you know, the, it became very personal for you rather than just an academic sort of pursuit? Hmm. It's hard to, to untangle those for me to some degree. Um, because there was me studying what other people were doing and trying to empathize and appreciate uh, what they were doing while um, trying to maintain some distance, you know, and, and to be able to look at that and synthesize it and mm -hmm. to present that back, you know, in a way that was intelligible to other people so they could read and understand what was sure. going on in these situations. But personally... I think it's all been, you know, like many of us might feel like it's all been a journey for me. Like, I mean, there have been uh, times in my life where I've been, you know, I was I grew up in a conservative Christian culture in Oklahoma. Um, but there were 
what I'll call radical elements of Jesus's lifestyle that really appealed to me Mm -hmm. and affected me deeply and really shaped how I thought. Things like what? Um, like, like dignity that he bestowed upon marginalized people, Mm -hmm. prostitutes, people that were rejected uh, tax collectors, yeah. people that were the, bar owners, uh, <laughs> bar owners. <laughs> yeah, um, that he um, saw past these superficial distinctions and 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 tr- and looked into the heart of others was and and recognized their humanity and their their dignity. Mm-hmm. Um, that was really powerful. Um, now, you know, part of my journey was you know also. Um, I think academics, maybe that gave me a chance to really dig into these texts, to really explore my own faith, to become appreciative of other perspectives, because I had grown up in a fairly, uh, you know, people didn't ask you what religion you were where I grew up. They just asked you where you went to church. <laughs> and the assumption was right. what that you were going to church, Yeah, you know. So it was part, of, it was w- woven into the cultural fabric of where I was. So... You know, by the time I got to seminary and I was, you know, um, attending Quaker meeting and, you know, studying academic, you know, academically the study of religion and really looking at it from various perspectives, you know, I had I had wandered far from my originary, you know, (laughs) roots. Mm. Um, But you kind of ask where I think one of the things you asked is where they connected to me. And for some reason, I'll just share this. And if it's worth anything, you can leave it in. And if not, you know, leave it out. But um, one summer in college, I was um, I was doing an archaeological dig in Israel. It was just a program that my college had that um, was really neat. And I just thought, hey, that's a great chance to get over there. Yeah, I you love know. the way you just casually say, I was just doing an archaeological day in <laughs> yeah. Israel of yeah. all places with your background. That had to be very <laughs> meaningful. Oh, yeah, it was. It was. And um, but as part of that, we got to travel a little bit. And one weekend we went down to Eilat, which is um, the southern part of Israel, and it borders the uh, Red Sea. And um, and we went snorkeling one day. And I expected, you know, like I would be able to swim out into the water and maybe see a fish I hadn't seen before, or just enjoy playing in the water. But I waded out into the water, and the minute I stuck my face mask down into the water, I was surrounded by fish of all shapes, sizes, colors, <laughs> um, swimming in different ways, moving through the water in different ways, pooling together as groups, swimming singly, silver flashes everywhere. It was like a light show. And like there was even an octopus like scurrying along the bottom of this. And I was surrounded in it. It wasn't like I was looking at it as an observer through a glass window onto an aquarium. I was enmeshed in it. You know, I was, I was, you know, part of it. And I started crying in my mask because <laughs> I realized uh, for maybe the first time in a, in a sort of non-bookish um, way that I was a land animal, and most of the earth was not covered in land. <laughs> no. <laughs> and in fact, all the, like, and granted that, that sort of more... S- you know, semi-tropical ecosystems are rich with life. And, you know, most of the ocean is probably, you know, uh, not chock full like that particular place where I, where I was. But realizing that, you know, two-thirds or three-fourths of the earth is covered in this salt water with which I am so unfamiliar and which so much is unknown and mysterious and vast and all these different forms of life that up to that point I had only seen on a screen or in a textbook – I, I, the smallness of my human existence uh, kind of crashed in on me, I think. <laughs> Which is a, a common starting place mm-hmm. for personal discovery, wouldn't you say? When you definitely looking up in the sky at night, or definitely. people, a lot of people would have a similar story. Definitely. But I think that story is a perfect time to pivot in our conversation to your book. First of all, because you're you're a fabulous writer, and we saw a little bit of it in your description of these fish in that moment in your life, and mm. we, and we get a lot of that in your book. 
um, which I really appreciate as a writer myself. Uh, uh, d- d- to find poetry, you know, lurking in places that I didn't expect it, th- that's special, and I want to call that out about your book. But also because we've been talking about our cultural tendency to, uh, as you said, think of human beings as uniquely unique. And we've sort of built this these cultural monuments to ourselves um, called cities. Hmm. And your book doesn't run away from the city, mm-hmm. which many environmentalists have, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, f- for understandable reasons, but your book is just sits down in the middle of the city, mm. Chicago of all places, and says, okay, let's see what's here. The way of coyote refers to the fact that coyotes are in the city. Yes. Along with numerous other species of animal that we think of as woodland creatures, and yet here they are. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Describe that moment where you were in the city and you realized, wait, this is not a separate place after all. Mm -hmm. Let's look at it. Yeah. How did you get to that idea? Well, I think um, I knew it intellectually. Like I knew that the city had been the sort of bad boy of concert, (laughs) you know, the kind of... um, uh, the kind of blank space of the conservation world um, that uh, the sort of anti-hero, you know, uh, on the landscape continuum, uh, and that you know, true conservation, true environmentalism happens in in wilderness and wild spaces, and the city is is something to shake the dust off your feet, you know, as you exit, not something to appreciate its rich ecological significance um it's a place and in some ways that reflects i think it it reflects a a certain view of of the human that what we do is necessarily degrading you know the things we build the that the places we live like we can't be there without messing it up that it's just sort of the way it is yeah that that's kind of the implicit in that notion of the city as a kind of uh, uh, you know, a degraded, you know, enervating cesspool is the idea that that human beings themselves aren't that great, and hmm. um, so I want to challenge that, you know. And uh, I wasn't, I, I, but I, I'm honest in the book. I wasn't thrilled about moving to a city. I was just kind of game, you know. <laughs> yeah. Let's see how this goes. Yeah. Um, But I did know before going in that Chicago had a network of groups called Chicago Wilderness. It was like over 300 different conservation groups from government agencies to nonprofits that had this coalition that people did care about the city as habitat. And there was an incredible forest preserves, one of the earliest ones that surrounded the city and and created all these green threads throughout the city. There was an incredible lake, Lake Michigan, this huge freshwater body that defined the shoreline of Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and that Chicago was built because, you know, 200 years ago, it was a portage route, a, a way to get into the interior of the continent uh, by canoe. Um, so I knew that there were these, these sort of broad strokes of Chicago. But when I moved to Chicago, I also knew that I mentioned orientation before. In order to orient myself in Chicago, I was going to have to get to know my non-human neighbors. How do other animals move through this place? How do they use it? How do they survive here? And for me, that's just a part of becoming an ecological citizen. Um, I know that might be a strange way of saying it, but it's a part of saying um, I'm as a as a part as a visitor or as a resident of this community. Um, it's not just a human community. So who else is here? And in what ways did your um, exploration surprise you? Well, um, there are a lot of surprises. Um, two come immediately to mind. One I'll start with was a little bit later, which I, I bought an inflatable kayak, and I began to kayak the uh, both the human-created 
channels that feed into the Chicago River and um, also the very um, modified Chicago <laughs> River itself. Well, that's probably not something you see every day in Chicago. <laughs> Somebody kayaking canals. You'd be surprised. It's 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 catching on. Oh, um, at least sort of toward downtown, where it's kind of becoming a recreational alternative uh-huh. to, you know, riding the architectural cruise ship or whatever. You know. Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, one thing about that experience is that you know, as you know, anytime you get a waterway in a, in an arid envi- environment like um, like the high desert, you know. Uh, or in an environment that is a lot there where there's a lot of pavement if you get a waterway it tends to concentrate life so I was you mentioned surprise and the first the thing that I I I think of being startled and you know coming up on a great blue heron when they're when you don't see them and they take off and give mm-hmm. a huge quark in your direction. <laughs> a little bit startling. And it's startling. <laughs> and then these, these huge birds with six-foot wingspans, you know, flying down Ooh, the yeah. middle of the Chicago River um, and then seeing turtles and, and beavers and um, mink and um, all the, the green herons, the black-crowned night herons, the, you know, the f- – flotilla of birds that that just concentrate in that uh, on along that waterway and meanwhile you have highways going over this waterway you have um people that don't even really know that in some places that the river is there you know Mm -hmm. so it's really a really cool juxtaposition so that's one thing the other thing i would say uh is in the first chapter of this book which is um walking along this golf course, which I do a lot of walking in the city, which is another way of kind of getting to know on foot what's uh-huh. there and being at a pace where you can get to know it. Um, and so I f- frequently visit this this public golf course because golf courses are also kind of, they just serve as de facto open space in, in, in a city yeah. where it's pavement. Animals tend to concentrate there. So, um, so I was walking along the golf course and I saw a pair of coyotes um, and they saw me and they, uh, sort of conferred together and then slipped back down the embankment. And then I passed them and I was about 50 yards away from the spot where I, I saw them. And I had this feeling that I was being watched and, you know, you get that feeling sometimes yeah. occasionally. And I turned around and one of the coyotes was just sitting there looking at me. And for me, that was really important, not just because it was kind of cool, but the idea that other animals were watching what we do in the city, and they're observing us as well. And a sort of very pragmatic reading of that will say, sure, it's survival. I mean, they have to know what we're up to and what we're doing. But for me, it was a lar- there was a larger metaphorical possibility there that that other animals are sort of waiting to see if we if we learn how to adapt to our landscapes and coyotes in particular being the quintessential adapters sort of watching us to see if we learn how to um, give deference to the places where we live well and coyote as the quintessential trickster yes as well sort of makes it uh I would say even more there's even more possibilities in some ways for that or at least new dimensions of that trickster narrative to unfold in an urban area because they're playing that role of boundary crosser where we think other animals should be and where they shouldn't be and coyotes muddy that boundary and they come right into the heart of the city uh, and live in downtown Chicago, you know. <laughs> and really put to the test things that we think we know. That's right. About how things ought to be. That's right. Well, this book is a marvelous challenge to that. Mm. And I love it for its ability to um, break down this barrier that we've built between um, a sort of domesticated urban environment and the rest of the world. And it's a challenge to anybody that's living in a high rise. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not as far away as you think. Mm. And you can, you can find it where you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I thank you for that. 
Yeah, we're out of time. We could talk for, for days, I'm certain. But well, can I say one thing yes, about that? Oh, please. 80% of people in the United States live in urban areas now. Over 50% in, in, on a global, in global cities around the world. Um, so where we make our connections, where our values are formed in our relationships and interactions with other animals uh, is critical. And I think that that happens close to home. Our, our most intimate relationships um, happen close to home and inform what we think about other landscapes and other creatures and other landscapes. So to me, it's really important. And one of the reasons, uh, motivations behind writing a book like this is to say, if we only open our senses and our eyes, we can find those moments of wonder and awe in our backyards. And it doesn't well, preclude us from visiting or being in those other areas, but we need to strengthen those connections where we are. But some people are precluded. I mean, some people just live where they live, and they're, they, they don't have either the resources or the means to be out communing in what we have traditionally called nature. Mm. So I guess the, the powerful message for me is that for a lot of those people, there's only one choice. If you're going to find these relationships, then you have to do it close to home. And the good news is they're to be had if you just look. Mm. Yeah. Gavin, thanks for the conversation. It's Thank been awesome. you. Thank you for your generosity. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think Planet.